want to know the truth about the murder of their grandfather and the fact that nobody has ever looked into this in my family. My mother was born on the day he died and she did, had no curiosity and her sister, our brothers, nobody looked into it. I, I, it. I can't understand that. Unfortunately, my family doesn't know a thing. My grandmother went to the grave with this. She didn't tell a soul. My uncle Dominic, who was there at the time, he didn't tell a soul. Everyone in the family kept saying to me, why are you doing this? Why are you working on this project? This, everybody's dead. Why do, you, why do you want to know what happened to grandpa? And I, I can't believe that they didn't want to know. They didn't have any curiosity. I'm just curious. I want to know what happened. So I thought that by recreating all of this and making the dolls, it's like putting myself in that world so I can play with the dolls and figure out what happened. And it's almost as if I'm there. I decided to use the dollhouse sets for my book because I was inspired by Frances Glesner Lee and her nutshell studies of unexplained death. I found them fascinating. She created these dollhouse crime scenes starting in the 1930s to help train detectives to be more observant. And I thought, this is a great way to investigate the crime. You know, to find out what really happened to my grandfather. Working with the dolls, I I really do believe that it has helped me find the truth about my grandfather. I am still looking for the truth, but I do think that I feel closer to them. It's such a labor of love that I love playing with the dolls. I love creating these scenes. I just, it's a labor of love, and this is even more so of a labor of love than some of my other stories because it's about my family. This is a doll of my grandfather, and he was a very ambitious man. He was a pyrotechnica back in Italy, which is a fireworks expert, and he was in the army. He was a very brave soldier in the army, so they gave him a free passage to America. He was ambitious. He was, they say he was a big man and a tough man, uh, but he was only, his autopsy records say he was only 157 pounds, five, five foot seven. So I think he had a really big personality. It was during Prohibition, and my family, they were Italian, they liked to drink their wine, and they didn't believe in Prohibition, they thought it was a joke. So, uh, so he opened two speakeasies. One of them was a bakery, like this one right here, and the other one was a club. And the bakery, they, the cops used to come and they would drink the espresso with the anisette. He's in for the coffee, you know how the cops are. As you can see, I've got the cop back in here. And the club, they actually had the peephole doors. Password! And they would look through and they'd have to have a password in order to get into the speakeasy. Another way I'm investigating is through an immersive play I created in an actual historic speakeasy. The audience and the actors are the dolls, and the speakeasy is the dollhouse. I just love the idea of taking this story and acting it out, and watching how the actors are interacting with each other to help me figure out what happened. With dolls, you know, I can make them do different things, and I can see the setting, but with real people, you never know what a real person might do. And so I'm giving them the basic storyline. Just give me some time. There's a very simple script, but they don't have to follow it. If they feel like going in a certain direction, they can. And I'm watching what they're doing, and it's fascinating, because it is giving me insight into what may have happened. So look, I'm Frank Spano. This is my club. We're here to drink because, of course, you can't drink anywhere else in New York City. Uh, not like this, anyway. And uh, we're here to celebrate something very, very special to me which is the impending birth of my son, right here. And so, without you, this couldn't be possible, because I'd be on the street, or back in Italy. And without my beautiful wife, Mary, none of that could happen. So Mary, why don't you tell everyone you're happy they're here. Pray to the Lord Jesus Christ for my baby. That's not, that's not what I meant. Uh, okay, look. <laughs> 
Tell them that it's going to be a wonderful night. Pray to St. Barbara to protect us from harm. <laughs> yeah, that, that too. All right, all right, all right. My grandmother was extremely religious. Here she is pregnant with my mother. She was sort of a tomboy. She, she liked to wear sensible shoes. She always wore her hair pulled back in a bun, a tight bun. Her hair was all the way down to her waist, but she always had it pulled back even when, you know, when she was older. And sometimes she would coil a braid over her head. And um, you know, I like to think of her sort of as Mary, the mother of God. Her name was Mary. She was very religious. Her whole house was covered with religious statues. So you'd go up this really small little skinny staircase and then you'd go in and there'd be covered with like big Jesus on crosses and, and uh, she was a very, very religious woman. So we knew that my grandfather was murdered, but we didn't know he owned speakeasies. That was sort of a big surprise. So my grandmother was in a nursing home at the time and my sister went to the nursing home and started asking my grandmother about it. And she was sick at the time, she was in bed, and she said, oh yeah, we owned speakeasies. We had a, one was a bakery, one was a club, and I used to ride shotgun in the ice truck when we would go and bootleg liquor, we'd go and buy our whiskey in Canada, and she would ride shotgun in the truck. And my sister said, why did you have a gun? Were you afraid of the, were you, you know, afraid of the, the getting caught? And she said, no, we were afraid of the mafia. Here she is, this little old lady in a nursing home, and she said, well, would, Grandma, would you have used the gun? And she said, of course I would. She would use the gun. So we thought that was really funny that Grandma was, here's this woman in a nursing home, and she's you know, saying that she would use the gun and shoot mobsters. The infamous mobster, Dutch Schultz, was also at the very same time was working at another speakeasy in the area, and they were trying to get everybody to buy their beer, to buy their liquor. So I don't know, perhaps... They were trying to get my grandfather to buy the liquor from, from them. You come around here and you threaten me and you threaten my business? I don't want to deal with you right now. Get off of me! Lulu, Lulu, Lulu. I expect better from you. Lulu, 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 Lulu. Then I guess we'll just talk about it later. Working with the dolls, one of the things I realized about my grandparents was I don't know if they were in love. And playing with the dolls, I, I never feel like the dolls have their arms around each other or they're holding hands. And I believe he may have had love with another woman. Hi, Frank. How are you? How are you? Nice to see you. Nice to see you. That's the only reason why, right? How you doing, John? I had better days, but... Yeah, what's the matter? You... I have a trouble with the barbershop? I have three different sources that tell me that there was something going on with Lucretia, the wife of the man who shot him. But sometimes things are not what they appear to be. Oh, Frank, I missed you. I think uh, I might need a nice delivery very soon. My mother told us the story of how her father died. She didn't know much. But she did say that he went to collect a debt. And when he arrived at the apartment, he had his son with him. Dominic was with him. And as he arrived at the apartment, he took off his coat. And as his arms were still in the sleeves of the coat, so his arms were caught like this. And then he was, he was shot. shot. And he couldn't defend himself. And that's all she knew. And then when I was doing my research, I discovered he didn't die in an apartment. And the debt he was going to collect appears to be a personal debt, not an ice, debt, not an ice dealer debt. And he was taking off his coat, but he was on the street. And if you take off your coat and it's March on the street, you're taking off your coat to fight. Gorari, come out here. Hey, Frankie. Guerrero, you yellow rat bastard, come out here! I'm not afraid to do it. Look at me, stand up straight. I'm standing up straight, Pa. I'm not afraid, I'm not afraid to do it. I'm not gonna be afraid to do it, Pa. Okay? Look, look, 
I could, I, I could do it, and, and I'm not gonna, and I'm, I'm not afraid of it. You think I'm afraid of it, Pop? Get upstairs. Grim, get out of here! Why do you think we moved? We're trying to get away from you, Spano. Do you know what it's like to see my wife admire somebody you like you? I am sick of this. You telling your son to spread rumors involving my son? My yeah. son is sick. This he is, shouldn't be fighting This is anybody. my family. This is my family. Your and son. my family is right in there, and they're sick. That's how you're going to deal with it? What are you going to do, shoot me? What are you going to shoot my son? You got no respect, Frank. I will beat you into the ground if you threaten my family. Aren't you afraid of anything, Frank? I'm not afraid of you. I'm not afraid of you. You come in, you threaten my you son. I'm not afraid of you. I'm sorry, but I got to do this. Library, and I was going through the microfilm and all of a sudden I saw this article and it was about a shooting I was looking for something about a shooting but it was about a child it mentioned the son I thought children and then I looked at the names and it was my grandfather and I was shocked he actually was didn't die at first he died a couple days later in the hospital and he, they told my grandmother the police brought her a paper which I have uh, a notice of death and she was pregnant with my mother she fell down and went into a coma and then when they were bringing my grandfather's coffin up the stairs to the apartment they dropped the coffin down the stairs it just fell and made a loud noise and that woke my grandmother up and she immediately went into labor so she had my mother was born in one room and in the room next to it my grandfather was laid out in his coffin The man who killed my grandfather, his name was John Guerreri, and he shot him on the street on the east side of Manhattan, and he threw away the gun and went into hiding. And they eventually, maybe a couple weeks later, they found him, they brought him in, he admitted to the shooting. He said, I did it, but on the paperwork it says he's not guilty. All right, I'm, I'm here under the case of 204171. My lucky number. John Greary, the murder of Frank Spano. I want to know. Who are witnesses here? Who we have witnesses? John Greary, uh, my question is to you. Did you shoot Frank Spano? No. Yes. I mean, yes, but I'm innocent. No, I had no choice. The guy is 10 feet tall. How am I supposed to stop him? He didn't even have a gun. There was a little note on the paperwork that said he was a small man and my grandfather was a big man. My grandfather wasn't really a big man, but like I said, I think he had a big personality. I have a sketch artist here. Sketch artist is right here. I need to see the sketch. That's not me. Look, that's him, that's him! That's him, that's him! 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 What? Case is what? dismissed! What? 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 I'm what? 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 How can you do that? How you do that? Apparently, the case is dismissed. He didn't even get a manslaughter charge. And manslaughter is mandatory. So it's really mysterious as to why his case would be dismissed. And I believe that his, the magistrate for his case was named Hulan Capshaw. He was disbarred from practicing law only a couple months after my grandfather's case was dismissed. He was working for Dutch Schultz. So I believe that Dutch Schultz had a direct relationship to my grandfather, and that's why this case was dismissed.
I do think I'm speaking for the dead. I asked my mother, I said, do you think that grandma would be mad that I'm doing this? Do you think that she would be, you know, this is her secret. And my mother said, no, I think she would be proud of you that you're, you're uncovering all of this and, you know, that I care so much about their, their lives that, that I, I'm, I am speaking for the dead, absolutely. And they have a lot to say. <laughs>